Well, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, and thanks, Hank, for your introduction to the service. And uh, some of these hymns are absolutely wonderful. And uh, it's a great privilege for me to be with you again once more and to have the opportunity to share with you something from God's Word. Now, <clears throat> there is such a thing as blindness caused by familiarity. That is to say that we can become so familiar with something that we cease to see its power and its beauty and, and its meaning. And part of the problem then is that we perhaps have a tendency to undervalue it or set it aside. And um, it can happen in all kinds of ways. It can happen in our relationships with one another. We begin to take one another for granted. And um, often when we come to scripture, it's the same. There are, there are sections of scripture, portions of scripture that are so familiar to us that um, we, think we, we think we know everything about them. And we become somewhat stale in response to them. And that's a great tragedy because that's very impoverishing and very damaging. And it's very important for us to take another look. And I know that in recent times in my own private Bible reading and study, I've been revisiting some passages of scripture which are very familiar to me and I'm sure are also very familiar to you. And there are a good many of them. I'm talking about passages like the Lord's Prayer or the Prodigal Son or some of these other great uh, parables that the Lord spoke. And most recently I've been revisiting another very well known part of scripture, Psalm number 23. And that's what I want us to do tonight, is to reflect upon that wonderful psalm. We'll read it together just in a moment. But this psalm, written by King David, of course, of Israel, a long time ago, it really is deeply impressive. It's very personal. It focuses on God and the individual. It focuses on God and me. In some ways it's very simple, but in other ways it's very profound. And it brings comfort and challenge to God's people and has done over many, many centuries. Psalm 23 holds spiritual power. It's both devotional and it's theological. It teaches us about God. And it demonstrates and calls from us a certain attitude towards God. And this great psalm comes, albeit through King David, it comes from the very heart of God. It's a psalm of God's faithfulness a psalm of Christian experience. It was written a long time ago, as we know, in the Old Testament, but its meaning and the fullness of its meaning is not made evident to us until the New Testament, until the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so I want us just quietly, reverently tonight to reconsider, revisit this wonderful psalm so let's read it together. I'm reading from the King James Version, the New King James Version. And here we have it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. 
He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's just take a moment to pray. Let's just come before the Lord. Oh, our Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you for each other. We thank you for this coming together. We thank you for the hymns that we've heard. And Lord, we just pray that as we turn to your word now, we will hear your voice. We need to find you in your word. We pray that you will speak to us tonight through this beautiful psalm. And we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, I suspect we are not really going to get beyond verse 1 of this psalm tonight. And verse 1, of course, begins with the Lord. The Lord. And he is where everything that is of true value begins. That's where the psalm begins. It begins with the Lord. And you know, in the first hymn that we sang together tonight, it's a wonderful old hymn that, and it recounts, especially in the first, first verse, wonderful aspects, characteristics of God, who is the Lord. He is Jehovah God, the Almighty One, the pre-existent One, the One who inhabits eternity. And the words of Scripture and the thoughts that flow from the words of Scripture and the words of the, these hymns that we sing, they stretch our minds to come to some inadequate understanding of the glory of who God is, who the Lord is. He is unchanging. He is transcendent. He is glorious in majesty and power. And his nature is love and truth. And he is mysterious beyond imagination. He is the creator the sustainer of all things, the source of time, the source of space, the source of energy, the source of all life, the source of life of every kind. He is the source of all truth, all moral sense, all moral sensibility is sourced in him. All wisdom is sourced in him. He is the source of all power, the source of all beauty, the Lord. We need to stand back in awe. We need to kneel and worship. He is the source of human consciousness is the source of human creativity and artistry. He is the source of our appreciation of this beautiful world in which we live. He is the source of human rationality, of human intellect. He is the source of true science. True science is not at enmity with him. The father of 
astronomy. One of the great thinkers and discoverers of planetary motion was a man called Johannes Kepler. And I love what Kepler had to say about this. He said that all that he had discovered by studying the planets and the orbits of the, the stars and the various galaxies, this is what he said. It's been my privilege to think God's thoughts after him. That's really what science is. It's a gradual unrolling, unfolding of what God has thought, of what God has done. And we use the gifts of our intellect to discover something of the amazing complexity and glory of what he's done in our world. He is the Lord of human history. He is the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and all the prophets. And above all, he is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his presence, the appropriate response is wonder, humility, praise, and worship. The Lord. Listen to what two other Psalms have to say. Many Psalms could have been selected for this purpose, but here is Psalm 8, verse 1. O oh Lord, our Lord. How excellent is your name in all the earth. And you have set your glory above the heavens, beyond and about and up beyond and out with the heavens in eternity. Here is Psalm 15. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle, in your dwelling place? Who could live there? Who may dwell in your holy hill? And so one thing we can be sure about tonight, whatever idea we may have of God, it is too small. We cannot capture him. And so we begin where Psalm 23 begins with the Lord. And we must never as the Lord's people, we must never, not individually, not in our family, not in our fellowships, we must never lose our sense of reverence before him, the sense of awe and wonder at who he is. He is the Lord. And then the first verse of Psalm 23, goes further and gives us a great revelation into the nature of the Lord, the nature of God, because it teaches us that the Lord is a shepherd. That's astonishing. The almighty God who inhabits eternity has shepherd characteristics he has a shepherd's heart. He is like a shepherd. And his people, those who have come to know him, they are like the sheep of his flock, the sheep of his pasture. Hank read that very phrase to us tonight. And so we need to ask ourselves, what does this mean? What does it mean? that the almighty God is prepared to have himself characterized as a shepherd. Well, we know that if we consider a shepherd and a sheep, that the shepherd and the sheep in their essence, the essence of their nature are very different. 
in our simple terms, of course, the shepherd is a is a man or as a woman, he's a, he's a human being and, and the sheep are animals. And there is a vast distance between who the shepherd is and what the sheep are. In his essence, God is so far above us. And yet, like a, a human shepherd, he is willing to identify himself with the sheep he is prepared to live with the sheep. That's what a human shepherd does. He spends days and nights in the company of the sheep. You might almost say he is prepared to live his life in fellowship with the sheep. That's what a good shepherd would do. Days and nights, storm and drought, in the company of the sheep. And the shepherd is wiser than the sheep. The shepherd understands the nature of the sheep. He understands their situation and their circumstances better than they do. He is wiser than them. And that as a result of that, he is capable of caring for them better than they can care for themselves. And because he is wiser than them, he is able to guide them better than they can guide themselves. He is wiser. He is above and beyond us. He is wiser than us. The shepherd is more powerful than his sheep. He is able to protect them in ways that they could not protect themselves. He is able to manipulate the circumstances in a way that the sheep could never do. And he, the, one, one might say that the, the shepherd cares for the sheep intensely. He loves the sheep. We could also say of a human shepherd that to some extent he is willing to sacrifice his life, his working life day after day, hour after hour for the blessing of the sheep, for the good of the sheep. And we need to reflect on that. The Lord, high and mighty and lifted up, is a shepherd. Well, the Lord Jesus spoke about the shepherd, as you know. And in John chapter 10, this is what he says. I am the good shepherd. I, I'm the, I am the shepherd of Psalm 23. I am the Lord of Psalm 23. I exist in that verse one day are both as God and as man. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. And I am known by my own and just as a father knows me even so i know the father and out of that communion out of that union of god the father and god the son there flows this i lay down my life for the sheep i am I am the good shepherd, the true shepherd, the eternal shepherd. I'm the shepherd of the human soul. I'm the shepherd of my people, the sheep of my pasture. And make no mistake about it, in saying these words that are recorded in John 10, the Lord Jesus is claiming identity, the same nature, the same divine being as the Lord of Psalm 23. He is claiming equality with God. He says, I know my sheep. I know who are mine. And I know who are not mine. They know me. They know who I am. 
and they recognize me as their shepherd. I know their nature. I know their condition. I know the situation of each one. And I lay down my life for them. I give my life for them. What a laying down of his life that was, wasn't it? In his incarnation, he laid down his life to become like us, a shepherd so committed, so willing to be identified with the sheep that he became like a sheep. The metaphor is intention, isn't it? That the almighty God would step down to be like us, to be one of us. His incarnation, he laid aside his life in order to be like us. And in his total submission here on earth, throughout the whole of his life here on earth, he was utterly committed to the Father's will. And in that obedience, in that dedication to his Father, he laid down his life to become the very image of God for us. He said to his disciples, you ask to see the Father if you've seen me. You've seen the Father. And in his perfect atonement, in the perfect sacrifice of Calvary, the unspeakable event of Calvary, he laid down his life in a way that you and I perhaps will never understand. But he laid it down. And to all those who believe in his name, out of that laying down, out of that horror, out of that price paid, out of that sacrifice made, we are gifted life and acceptance and health and joy. It's an astonishing thing. And then the Lord goes on to speak some more about the sheep. He says in John 10, still there, verse 17, sorry, 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. What are the distinguishing features of his sheep? Well, they know him. He said, my sheep know me. They know that I am their shepherd. They have accepted me as their shepherd. They have also accepted me as their Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. That's the beginning of it. And they hear my voice. They listen to what I say. They find me and my words through the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. They hear my voice. They listen. And not only do they listen to what I say, they heed what I say. And as a result of hearing and heeding, they follow me. They act on what I say. They trust me to choose the way forward. That's what it means to be one of his sheep. To allow him to go ahead, to lead. And he goes with them. It's not that he stays at a great distance from them and, and issues advice. It's that he walks with them and he goes ahead of them. And that going ahead of us is the eternal fellowship that is offered to us in this life as his disciples, as his sheep. 
and he says to them, you recall the beginning of John's gospel to those that received and believed in his name, I give them eternal life. They don't earn it. They don't discern it. They don't deserve it. I gift it to them. And I fit them now for eternity for the Father's house. And they will never perish. Did you notice what he says? He says that the people he's talking about, humble Christian folk, who simply trust in him, they are held in his hand, and no one can snatch them out of his hand. And he says, they're also held in my father's hand. And I and my father are one, and it's almost as if the two hands come together and they cup together. And you and I live in that shelter, in that protection. And the son and the father between them, they utterly protect us and they shall never perish. But we see the inspired sequence, the outcomes for those of us who are his sheep. We have to recognize him and receive him as shepherd and Lord. Shepherd because he is Lord. We have to listen to his voice. We have to act on his voice day by day in the things we do and the things we say. We act on his voice. And we have to learn to follow him into the future through life. And that following is an eternal fellowship with him. 1 Corinthians 1 9 is one of the great verses of the New Testament. It says this. God is faithful and he has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. Go with him, walk with him, follow him into the future. They follow me and they follow me through this life in that eternal fellowship, leaning on me, receiving power through me and through the spirit of God walking with him day by day, becoming more like him day by day. And these are the ones who have the life of eternity given as a gift. And they are secure, utterly, unshakably secure in that life for all time and all eternity. And on that basis, we all have rest. In Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Note the change of tense. The Lord is my shepherd. Present. I shall not want. Future. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the present of being shepherded by him flows into an experience that lacks nothing that is for our best blessing. That's a shepherd's action. I shall not want. You see how that transforms our present. It takes away our fear. The Lord is my shepherd and so, therefore, I will not want. I shall not want. I can drop my fear of the future. My fear and anxieties are dispelled because he is my shepherd. And my fear is replaced by confidence and hope. Of course, it, it does not mean I shall not want. It does not mean that I shall have everything I, I desire. No, it means I shall not want anything that is for my best blessing. It's not simply a case of God's going to give me whatever I ask for. He will work with me and walk with me and teach me what is best for me. And that is what he'll take me to. 
present blessing of what is truly good, albeit undeserved. And the question that I have to ask myself, and I invite you to ask yourself, is this, do you really trust him as your shepherd? Is he leading me on the journey of life, lifelong learning in him? Am I really increasing in my knowledge of God through him, day by day and month by month? You know, as a Christian, I shouldn't be the same today as I was a year ago. Not if I'm walking with him. We're on a journey. We're making progress. And you see how this psalm, it is about a journey. You see where it begins. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want anything that has true value. I shall, I shall not lack that, anything that is of true value. And we're on a journey, and where are we going? We're going to the Father's house. We're going to be where God is. We're going to live there. And Hank was sharing with his mother earlier. That's where she is. She's gone the journey. And we see that in this glorious psalm. If we link verse 1 and verse 6. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Surely. Goodness and mercy. Shall follow me. All the days of my life. And I will dwell. I will live. And go on living. In the house of the Lord. Where God is. Where God lives. For ever. There's no qualification. In the word forever. It's forever. For all eternity. We're at home with him. So I rejoice in this wonderful psalm. And in that first verse, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. May God bless his word to us tonight. Amen.